Welcome, my name is Marty Shankman. I'm joined by Christine Pronick. <laughs> and I'm going to say the firm name right PKF O'Connor Davies. Yes. Got it? Got it? Good. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to make sure I get all the initials right. Sure. Um, so, the topic of this video clip is some basics on trust income taxation. It's almost kind of a, 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 a contradictory title because I don't know if there's anything basic when you talk about trust income taxation. Trusts are ubiquitous in estate planning. Trusts are ubiquitous in asset protection planning. No matter what wealth level you have, you should be using trusts. You don't want a minor child to inherit money. And frankly, why would you even give an adult child money outright if you can put it in a trust given a 50% divorce rate? We all know the reasons for using trusts. So let's now focus on some of the income tax planning. There's two broad categories, uh, if you will, of trust for income tax purposes. A grantor trust in which the income is taxed back to the settlor, trustor, grantor, setting it up, and a non-grantor complex trust. And it can get complex, as Christine will enlighten <laughs> us. But let's talk um, really just about the complex or non-grantor trust. Sure. Um, what are some of the basics? How do you determine trust income? What's it patterned after? What are some of the issues? What are the alphabet soup of DNI, FAI? You know, I remember as a kid eating alphabets. Maybe that's what you <laughs> did while you went into this area. Talk, talk to us a little. Um, well, when you're first working on a trust income tax return, you want to, of course, look at the trust document. And Novel concept. Yeah, right? We're looking I at the blueprint. Oh, my gosh. I cannot <laughs> tell you how many times when I've had questions on trust income tax returns, and I ask the accountant, because maybe it's a new client, I don't have the trust, could you get me a copy of the trust agreement, assuming they have a permanent file and they have right. the trust, and hopefully what they even have in the trust is an extra copy where they've annotated all the little comments that help us get through it. Mm -hmm. I don't know about all of you listening or you, but... You know, I, I still like my old yellow highlighter. Or what I actually do nowadays <laughs> is I'll convert the trust to, to a Word document, and I'll go through and highlight and add descriptive terms and comments so that I can focus on what I need to focus on on this 75-page document. You know, there may be a few pages that have some of the most critical stuff to figuring out the income tax. Um, but you've got to start with the trust document. Exactly. Maybe make a few comments on that. Re knowing what to look for in the trust document, what terminology or what provisions will make it a grant or trust, as Marty mentioned, there's grant or trust type, um, and or what language you're looking for to see if it's a simple trust where all the income, the fiduciary accounting income, has to be paid out at least annually to a beneficiary, or, or a complex trust where you've, the trustee has the discretion. You have to go through that document to at least see, so what am I dealing with? And in addition, there could be trigger dates. When somebody turns 35, maybe 25% of the trust has to be distributed. i got to ask you a question. So how mm -hmm. often do you see a trust where, let's say, at age 30, the kid is supposed to get the money and they're now 60 and it's still in the trust? <laughs> Fairly often. Yeah. And it's, um, but you want to be aware of those dates and know when that has to happen because when you do the income tax return for that year, you have to know, oh, this should have taken place, a distribution should have happened. So the document is, is step one to just figure out what you're dealing with and have your whole picture. For any accountants listening to this, if you don't feel fully comfortable reviewing a trust document, and sometimes you will on a simpler trust, mm -hmm. some trusts are just very complicated, and it you know depends on the language used, depends on the goals, depends on the sophistication, complexity of the planning. Tell the client you need to meet with the attorney that drafted the trust for an hour or two and go through the instrument the first time you get the engagement. There's no reason not to. And for those taxpayers or trustees doing this, to have the attorney that drafted the trust meet with the accountant the first time they're starting to do returns, very good investment. Now that makes perfect sense because Doesn't you can read through. Often. <laughs> <laughs> you can read through and interpret it, but why not have the person who drafted it bless your your findings and say yes, that is, it's a grant or trust or it's a simple trust. Right. A good idea. What, what's DNI and what does that have to do with trust income taxation? Your distributable net income is the amount of income that can be deducted as a distribution deduction on the return itself, and then also what will be picked up on the K1 or K1s, the tax reporting statement that goes out to the beneficiaries. So, so the concept is really to avoid taxing the same income twice. Exactly. So if the trust earns $10,000 and pays you as the beneficiary $7,000, it doesn't seem to make sense to tax the trust on 10 and you on 7, now we've taxed the same 7 twice. Exactly. So the DNI supposedly is a deduction that will, so my 7 will come off of that 10. So the remaining right. 3 will be taxed in your trust and the 7 will come over and be taxed to me. So that's part of the planning uh, benefits of a complex trust because if you have 4 kids and one's living in a no tax state like Florida and one's living in California, which is I think 13% <laughs> change, the highest in the country I believe. Um, can't you shift income as part of your planning to the kid, say, in Florida, and shift income to a, a lower tax bracket? 
Exactly. You can make the distribution out to the child, assuming you've got the discretion in the trust to do that, to the child in Florida. You won't have to worry about the state income tax, and you didn't leave it in the trust to get hit at whatever state the trust is taxed in. I'm going to show you how nice I'm going to be. I'm not going to ask you what happens under 199A for taxable income. Oh, thank God. Yeah, we only have five minutes, right? Right. I'm not going to do that. Talk to me, uh, FAI, fiduciary F accounting income. Right. How does that relate to DNI? What's the use of that? Sure. Fiduciary accounting income you need to be aware of because that's the actual, in the trust document that you're reading when it says income must be distributed at least annually. Let's say we're dealing with a simple trust. That's fiduciary accounting income, which you're going to look to the state in which the trust is, is governed, I guess the state law it's governed by, see how they recognize FAI. Most states go under the Uniform Principal and Income Act. And then you want to compute your FAI because that's what's actually being distributed to your beneficiaries. That then also has DNI has to come into play to figure out how much of a deduction you can get. So FAI is very important because that's where you're saying, all right, this is what can go out to my beneficiary. DNI then would be your ceiling on how much of a deduction you could get because you could push out more in FAI but be stuck somewhere and have a lower DNI or lower deduction amount. And really, where FAI is very important is pass-through entities. I see this mistake made a lot. Someone has a partnership that the trust owns an interest in, and you have a K-1. Well, now you've got K-1 numbers. That's your taxable income. The distribution that you got from that partnership is your fiduciary accounting income. So you want to be aware that you can't look at a $20,000, let's say, of interest income on the K-1 and think, well, I'll make a distribution, and that'll go out to my beneficiary. I'll move it out of my trust. If there were no distributions from that partnership to that trust, you, don't, you have zero FAI from the partnership. You can't really push that out to the beneficiary. You're stuck, and it's trapped. So FAI is a very important concept in understanding and in correctly taxing the trust. Um, let's try another acronym. We, sure. didn't, we didn't discuss this one <laughs> when we, we were talking before, so I, I will, we'll do it together. Uh, net Investment Income Tax, NIT, N -I -I, yes. net investment in, N -I -I -T. <laughs> so we can get another acronym out. Mm -hmm. uh, comments, thoughts on what people need to look for? Uh, Another thing to be aware of what we were mentioning before, you might want to push distributions out to a beneficiary in a low income tax state for state taxes. You want to watch on at the trust level very quickly, what, 12,005, I think? Are we still at that number? You would have, you could have your net investment income tax concerns if you've got net investment income in the trust. If your income is over 12,500, now we're dealing with that 3.8% tax. Yeah, I can't remember if it's 12,500, 12, 12, 12. I know, they if changed, it moved to 12,700, maybe? They changed it with the Don't quote me on the tax act. I think it changes <laughs> next year. Um, one of the things to consider for the net investment income tax is, is the trustee an active participant in the business? Yes. So let's say um, uh, you are not actively involved in a family business. If you were to earn the income, it would be subject to net investment income tax. If your interest is given to a trust that's a non-grantor trust and the trustee is active in the business, uh, and that's not fully clear how a trustee materially participates to be active, uh, that's another whole video <laughs> clip we could do. But, um, if the trustee is active in the business, then that net investment income tax should no longer apply. Correct. And on the individual level, even a minor child subject to the a child, I guess it doesn't have to be a minor, subject to the kitty tax, still gets their own, what is it, $200,000, $250,000 bucket for net investment income tax purposes? I believe so, yes. So you can, you can distribute out money to even beneficiaries, as you were mentioning, mm -hmm. and maybe avoid some of the net investment right. income tax. Spread it around. One last thing to wrap up is state income tax, mm -hmm. which is incredibly complex. Some comments on how to plan and what might happen? Um, definitely be aware of, you mentioned before even if you had a California beneficiary, you have to file in California if you have a beneficiary. You have to file in California if you have a California That's trustee. That's accountants, right? You, oh, <laughs> extra returns. <laughs> but you definitely want to be aware of she what your excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> what your location of your trustees, where, where your beneficiaries reside, that will tell you or impact where you have to file and what states you have to file in. Be aware of what states you might just have to file in but don't have income tax nexus. New Jersey has a perfect example. A trust could start off with income tax nexus in New Jersey, but if now your beneficiaries have moved, your trustees have moved, um, let's say the grantor who set it up has passed away, you don't have assets, no real estate or anything, no, no New Jersey source income, right. you still have to file a New Jersey non return, resident. but you don't have to pay tax. Exactly. Non-resident trust. Non yes. Or resident trust with no income tax liability. Right. So. You have to really weigh all these different things. The starting point, as Christine explained, is, is really going through the trust instrument to see what that entails and what that provides for. And then trying to balance, which is pretty, pretty difficult, <laughs> probably impossible to get quite exact, the state income tax issues, the net investment income tax issues. We didn't even get into the 199A, which no. is another whole trip. 
uh, of, of complexity that I don't even think we really quite know how that plays out. Still waiting. <laughs> well, we had one set of proposed regs that were only, what, about a zillion pages long? Right. Um, the other thing is that even if you grasp all of these points that we've talked about, that's not the end answer because what if you can decant the trust, merge it into a new trust, or by non-judicial modification of state law that provides, permits it, where the uh, parties all agree to change the trust, or through perhaps a trust protector action, or merely even the resignation of a trustee so the successor's in a different state, right. you can influence some of these factors. Maybe the successor trustee's active in the business and you can avoid the NIT tax by changing trustees. So it's really an incredible, complex array of issues uh, that sometimes are very interrelated, sometimes not, and really the planning is to balance all that. Right. So for those that think um, preparing a 1041, a trust income tax return, <laughs> is uh, uh, a simple matter, it, uh, it rarely is. There's a lot there. If they think it's simple, they don't fully understand it. <laughs> no, that's a scary thought. Um, thank you for joining us. The uh, video has uh, been for educational purposes and not the provision of tax or legal advice. And especially for this topic, be really careful because state law can differ dramatically and really affect every point we talked about. Thank you.